welcome to uh, this lecture on MMT and the Euro. <clears throat> My name is Dirk Inns and um, I'm about a kilometer away from you guys um, because I was hit by the bug. So hopefully um, we can talk about this in person maybe from Tuesday onwards, um, but right now I present it in this way. So this is all based on an entry, entry by, uh, in the MMT handbook by Eva and Randy, which is forthcoming. So let's start with the article by Wynne Gordley in the London Review of Books, since we are at the levy. So he wrote in that article, which was about the Eurozone, so early on, 1992, the Euro didn't uh, come about until 2002 in cash. So early on, Wynne Gordley wrote, I think that the central government of any sovereign state ought to be striving all the time to determine the optimum overall level of public provision the correct overall burden of taxation, the correct allocation of total expenditures between competing requirements and the just distribution of the tax burden. And then discussing the euro, he said, or well, he wrote, if a country or region has no power to devalue and it is not the beneficiary of a system of fiscal equalization, then there is nothing to stop it suffering a process of cumulative and terminal decline, leading in the end to emigration as the only alternative to poverty and starvation. So that is pretty, pretty good, because that's exactly what happened during the austerity years, um, when in the 2010s, uh, countries had very high deficits, too high judged by the European Union, 3% um, or more, and then they cut down government spending as a result. And then people could only choose to either emigrate or to, to be left in poverty. Um, also, starvation apparently happened to some extent. So then another sentence, which is one underlined, I sympathize with the position of those like Margaret Thatcher, and Wint Gordley was an economist of the left, so this was pretty, pretty big, who faced with the loss of sovereignty wished to get off the EMU train altogether. I also sympathize with those who seek integration under the jurisdiction of some kind of federal constitution with a federal budget very much larger than that of the community budget. So one of the main points I think in this talk is that the euro is a political project more than an economic project. It is something which was supposed to complete the European Union. Um, so the idea was not to have what we have today, but to follow through at some point with euro treasury so that there would be a very large, well, European uh, government and not commission. So I think Gordy and many other economists understood that the euro would be unstable from the start. Those who understood it either then said, let's get off this, like Margaret Thatcher, or we can get off this train by completing the euro later. It's a so-called coronation theory of, of the euro. So the, the euro was from the beginning a political project. <clears throat> so how did it happen? So this is, of course, economic history. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of history, according to Fukuyama, um, efficient mar markets seem to have won and the inefficient state seem to have lost. The neoliberal mindset ruled when the euro was designed and there was no MMT around. Eurozone would, the eurozone would have a European central bank but no European treasury or fiscal capacity as envisioned in the 1970s in earlier plans of European integration. National fiscal policy was ruled by arbitrary deficit limits, 3% of GDP and unenforceable public debt limits, 60% of GDP. So there's really nothing scientific that backs up those numbers. I think the 3% were invented by a clerk or lowly bureaucrat from the uh, Ministry of Finance in France because it was roughly uh, a, a number that was not harmful to Mitterrand, who was president back then. And the deficit was in France, I think something like a little bit over 2%. So 3% was, was supposed to be far away from that. And also the spreads for government bonds were a feature, not a bug. So the idea that other bonds than German bonds trade at a discount to those German bonds, um, that was supposed to be a feature. So those governments which did not do well with their spending and as a result had a lack of economic growth and, and a lack of tax revenues, those countries should be punished by the markets. And if the Germans misbehaved, they would be punished by the markets too. Okay, so this kind of idea that the financial market punishes a government, that was a feature of the Eurozone. Um, sometimes it is disputed nowadays, but it was always a feature and not a bug. And then there was also the no bailout clause, which is a bit of a pirate kind of clause. So who falls behind is left behind. 
So those countries who get into kind of debt troubles, they should not be helped by the ECB or by other countries. Well, here's the results. Um, you look at unemployment rates in percent, uh, various countries, 1995, 2019. So again, the euro was introduced in 2002. Exchange rate were fixed in 1999. So you could say 1999 roughly is, is where it starts. And um, yeah, you can see that unemployment rates were highest in the euro area almost all of the time, only topped in the first couple of years by European Union unemployment rates, which of course, of course includes the euro area. Um, and unemployment rates are way higher than those in other countries like the United Kingdom, Japan, or the United States. You can also see that, for example, during the global financial crisis around 2010, apart from, I think, Japan, almost all of these countries, they go up to, to unemployment rates, which are somewhere between 8 and 10%. Okay, so you can say that these numbers must more or less make sense, they more or less match. So um, it's not the measure of, of statistics here, but it's really the result that unemployment rates in the Eurozone has been persistently higher than everywhere else, which of course is macroeconomic policy failure and means that the Eurozone so far has been dysfunctional. Well, here you can see government spending and taxation. So of course, with the Keynesian background, you would suggest that if there's a lack of full employment, probably the governments don't spend enough money, and this is exactly what hap has happened. So here you can see the austerity policies 2010 to 2014 where government spending is flat. And this is also the time where unemployment rates go up um, and they increase to, I think, 25% roughly in Greece, for example, while staying low in other countries like Germany. So this also means that, of course, the government is not doing its job in terms of investing in the public infrastructure and in public goods. So this is net fixed capital formation for the general government as a share of GDP. Um, so 100 is 1 percent, so this reads as in 2009 roughly it was 0 0.9 percent of GDP which went to public investment and then it dropped in the austerity years and it, it was net zero for many years and only just before the pandemic hit it came back to something which was a positive value. So governments are, are letting the infrastructure go, um, politicians are not doing their job, they're not providing the infrastructure and the public goods that they, that they should. They've just give, given up. <clears throat> okay, so before we look at the sectoral uh, balances, and I'm kind of hoping that you already were introduced to this concept, we can look at the monetary circuit uh, with a figure like this. So um, if you think about the monetary circuit as, as us basically receiving income by offering labor and then going out buying consumer goods and maybe also a flat sometimes, well, then the question is, how is money injected into that kind of circuit? And you can inject it through government spending, which we call fiscal policy. You can inject money through bank lending, for example, which we call private investment. Or you can also inject money through exports, um, which we normally call trade policy viewed together with imports. And then money is destroyed when taxes are paid, um, but money is also destroyed, at least bank deposits are destroyed um, when um, loans are repaid. Um, money is also taken out of the circuit when people are saving money, so not using that bank deposits. And money is going out of the circuit if you are importing because some, some non-domestic person has the deposits and is not sure what will happen. And um, of course, if there's a fiscal deficit, there must be a surplus in one of the other two sectors. Um, so I have used the colors here so that you can see in the next graph what's going on. So this is the sector balances of the Eurozone. So you can see that it had consistent deficits in 2008, 9, 10. These were the crisis years. And of course, you had private surplus of the same size. So the private sector was only able to save money because the government's deficit spent money into the economy. And um, then in the years following those, um, the situation changes a bit. So the Eurozone, because it is kind of killing its own economy with its austerity policies, if you reduce consumption, you also reduce imports because some of your consumer goods will be imported. And people will also spend less money on energy and other things which are often imported. So the, the green bar tells you that now the Eurozone has a current account surplus versus, versus the rest of the world. Well, this is um, aggregated for the whole of the Eurozone. So it makes sense to have a look at individual countries to see what the problem is. So here's a country that has been doing reasonably well, I would argue, 
um, where nevertheless the working class has not benefited um, from the policies of the 2000s, which was the suppression of, of wage growth. So here you can see the German export model and you can see that the blue bars, the surplus of the private sector, almost exclusively comes from the green bars. So because the German uh, export sector is so successful in, in a way of, of moving goods that were produced in Germany abroad so that they cannot be consumed at home, the opposite of this is, of course, money flows in the other direction. Okay, so this is a completely different model than, than most of the other Eurozone countries. And, of course, not everybody can follow this kind of model because not every country can be a net exporter. Okay, so if Germany would not export so many goods and services, it would not be able to have these high private savings in both the household sector and in the firm sector. It even had a public surplus, so the red bar here is, is on the positive side, which means that tax revenues are above government spending. That does not mean that the government is not engaging in Keynesian policies, they did. Okay, so in the whole 2010s, whether Scholz or Schäuble were finance ministers, always arguing anti-Keynesian more or less, um, but both increased government spending at the federal level at 3 or 4 percent and private investment was crowded in. We have a real estate bubble, I would say, in Germany, which was developing through the 2010s. So the economy was, was booming, so this is why tax revenues increased more than government spending. Um, and that's, this, this shows the, the case for Germany. Um, this is Spain, which is um, a country that struggles with the euro um, because it had the real estate bubble in the 2000s. Um, you can see that the private sector in blue went into deficit quite a lot. And then this was turned around um, after 2008. And then in Spain, you have again uh, a period where private investment and private consumer spending are low and the government needs to support the economy. But government spending was not increasing uh, as, as much as it should have been because of the deficit rules of the Eurozone. Okay. Um, so the Eurozone imposed these austerity policies from 2010 onwards after a brief 2009 fiscal stimulus, which was worldwide. The so-called Troika, ECB Commission and IMF imposed so-called structural reforms, um, well, reducing the power of unions, also reducing public sector wages and public sector jobs. The Greeks um, in 2014 voted against austerity, but Brussels imposed it anyway, which was a very bad result, I think, because here you had, um, well, uh, democracy uh, and uh, sovereignty on one side and some kind of financial constraint system uh, yeah, uh, system on the other side um, well and that has led now to political fragmentation so in terms of politics it is usually Germany against the periphery which is almost everybody else so um, the European Union hasn't been doing anything uh, in the last 10 years or not much let's let's put it like this um, because of the fall, fallout from this kind of crisis. Public debt to GBP ratios uh, are way beyond the 60% imagined or envisioned in the Maastricht Treaty, which is the Stability and Growth Pact Foundation. So there's no hope of, of going back to those numbers, which means that the, the rules have to go out of the window anyway. And here's real GDP for some Eurozone countries. As you can see, Germany and France have recovered, um, Greece not so much. Uh, Spain and Italy have recovered somewhat, um, but you can see that especially Greece and Italy are, are cases where um, the economic development is, is not going well. Um, you don't have to be a supporter of, of using real GDP as, a, as an indicator of how things are going. Uh, I could also have shown unemployment rates maybe. So unemployment rates are also not okay in Spain, Italy and Greece. Well, what's the problem then? Why not increase government spending? Um, let's have a look at how this works. So um, the German Treasury has an account at the German Central Bank, which you see on the upper left. It's called Bundesbank, Deutsche Bundesbank to be precise. So the Ministry of Finance wires more or less a payment uh, instruction to the Bundesbank. And if they pay me, they just increase the reserves of my bank. So my bank has deposits at Deutsche Bundesbank, which is their spreadsheet more or less. And they, the Bundesbank just increases this account by a thousand euros, and then my bank increases my account by a thousand euros, and that's how I get the money. At the same time, Bundesbank debits the general account of the German government, um, and that's about it. Okay, so this is how um, the, the German Treasury spends, which is um, a little bit easier than it uh, than what happens in the U.S. when the federal government spends, because yeah, it has 
first to have a positive number in the general account of the government. In Germany, we don't have that. So the uh, Ministry of Finance, nevertheless, is required to bring that account back to zero by the end of the day, because otherwise the Bundesbank will not be able to do this on the next day. Okay, so intraday um, they can do this, but at the end of the day, the German government will need to have tax revenues and bond revenues put into that account to, to balance that account and to put it back into positive territory. Um, just like in the US case, this is one state institution having deposits at another, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at another state institution. So <coughs> it's not like they owe um, something to each other, excuse me. <coughs> Okay, so you must think of this balance more like an accounting balance, um, but not money. So even the Deutsche Bundesbank is clear that the deposits in the account of the government are not money. So we also know that the ECB knows what's going on. Um, so here's Christine Lagarde. As the sole issue of euro-denominated central bank money, the euro system, which is the European Central Bank plus the national central banks, will always be able to generate additional liquidity as needed, which means we can type as much euros into existence as, at, as we want, both at the ECB and at Deutsche Bundesbank, also Banco d'Italia or Banco de España. Um, there's no, no lack of money, okay? So how does the German government then sell bonds? Well, they sell bonds only to a couple of banks. On the right-hand side, you have the Bund Issues Auction Group, um, so these are the only banks that can buy government bonds directly from the, from the government. Okay, so you can clearly see that households, for example, cannot finance the German government because the households can, government, can buy government bonds only from banks. And that means that their money ends up with the banks or they reduce the amount of deposits they have with the banks. But it's impossible that the German government receives money directly from the households. Um, so again, um, the idea that German households somehow finance the deficits or the spending of the German government, uh, it's technically impossible. So I always use this idea of a green light. So the central account of the government has to be brought to zero because this is a political rule in the Eurozone. It's not something which is technically necessary. They could do without. Okay, here's the target to payment system. Um, which is the uh, Eurozone's payment system. And we can see here what happens when a German household buys something from a Spanish household for a thousand euros. Um, you can see that um, bank deposits are going up then in Spain, um, and so are reserves. And now, of course, the German bank has less reserves and Banco de España has more reserves. And this is kind of unbalancing their balance sheets. Okay. Um, it, it, it would be okay like this, there's no problem, because the central banks, nobody would doubt that they can create money. So even if they have a loss of equity, for example, or negative equity, um, there wouldn't be any problem. But in the Target 2 system, they decided to just put in some balance sheet, um, balance sheet positions to balance those kind of um, movements of, of reserves. So the Bundesbank would then get a Target 2 liability to balance the outflow and, outflow and reserves. Um, and the Banco de España would receive a Target 2 asset to balance the increase in reserves. And now this is very important. Please note that Target 2 assets and liabilities are not assets and liabilities. They have no maturity and they're automatic and unlimited. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion here, um, mostly due to a famous German economist. Um, but these Target 2 assets and liabilities, they are just called Target 2 assets and liabilities. It's, it's as if you had two cats and you call them, one you call asset, and the other one you call liability, okay? And this will not be debts of yours or, or somehow belong to your net private wealth. Um, these are still two cats. And these balance sheet positions here, they, they are not assets and liabilities. Um, you could do without them. And um, some people also think that the central banks of the Eurozone have then accounts with the ECB. No, that's not the case. And also on the ECB's balance sheet, you don't find target two assets and liabilities. It's just a bookkeeping kind of, of exercise, but it has, it has nothing to do with debts and liabilities. Okay, um, so, well, we went um, for 20 times uh, with the euro, 
and um, we have gone from Trichy to Draghi and then on to Lagarde. So Draghi was telling us he would do whatever it takes, buying up government bonds so that default risk would be zero. Changes to the stability and growth, growth pact were made, the escape clause inserted, inserted. We now have the macroeconomic imbalance procedure at plus 4% of current account surplus or minus 6% current account deficit. And austerity policies uh, were silently phased out in 2014 and governments with excessive deficits by the Eurozone's definition were not punished. So in 2019, there were 10 countries in breach of this excessive deficit procedure and only one of them was punished. So they kind of stopped applying the rules because the rules didn't work. A Green Deal was created by the European Commission in 2019, which I think is not as good as we would like to, to, to see it. Um, but it's the first step into this kind of direction of a Green New Deal. And we've had the decade of zero interest rates without a full recovery also, which means that mainstream economic paradigm um, of inflation targeting has lost its credibility, which Michael Woodford in a recent article in the American Economic Review also recognizes. So policy makers and politicians don't believe anymore that interest rates uh, have some, some big effect on the economy. Um, let me skip this figure, or let me just say one word. I mean, interest rate payments are coming down because interest rates are, are going down. This uh, increases fiscal space under the existing rules. Um, well, this is a policy space we end up with in the Eurozone. Um, so you can see here the sectoral balances. So you are allowed to have a fiscal surplus, which is, which is good, but in terms of the fiscal deficit, 3% of the deficit is enough. That's the line. So you go from, from the top to the bottom, and then you go to the left because you can have some kind of deficit in the current account of 4% minus, or you can have a surplus maximum of 6%. So this defines your policy space in the Eurozone, West, which, as you can see, is, is kind of narrow. Well, now the response to the COVID pandemic was that the escape clause was activated um, until this year, but um, I think it was um, activated until next year. I think they just um, increased it by one year, um, maybe two weeks ago. Then there's the Epidemic Emergency Purchase Program, which is a bond purchasing program by the ECB, which was up to almost 2 trillion euros. So the ECB said, okay, um, we buy up all those new government bonds that you will need to fill up your accounts in order to use your central bank for making payments. So don't worry about it. Um, if we buy up all those government bonds on the secondary market, the banks will be happy to buy them on the primary market because they can make a profit with that. Um, and they will always have an investor uh, with us. So the ECB turned into a dealer of last resort in terms of government bonds. De facto, it returned monetary sovereignty to national governments. Um, so again, normally you have the stability and growth pact and the deficit limits of 3%, which limit government spending, at least ex post. Mm -hmm. And um, you would normally be a little bit careful about increasing government spending too much because there might not be enough demand for your government bonds. But both these limiting factors were fixed. Okay, so governments of Spain, Ireland, uh, also Italy or Germany, they can spend whatever they want to spend right now and also next year. Um, there's, there's no limit. Deficits will not be punished and the bonds that you are, you are putting on the market. Well, of course, it's a bit of a discussion now that the ECB has um, kind of, they, they, um, um, well, they, they, um, they, take, they took the pandemic emergency purchase program away and said we will still buy up enough bonds in order not to have problems. And they've, uh, they've been acting in a bit of a strange way in the last couple of weeks and months, um, letting spreads go up, meaning that government bonds are falling in price in Spain and Greece and other countries. Um, and um, to some extent, they have promised that they will, they will intervene again. So I, I don't think that this will lead into a full-blown crisis. There was also something which is called Next Generation EU, debt by the European Commission, at first towards the Euro Treasury, which is part of the plan to build up. And of course, we have a record employment rate in the Eurozone in 2022 because of all the increases in government spending. And <clears throat> then as an unintended consequence of the Ukraine war, I think that the Euro will stay. Um, there were a lot of debates in the last couple of years, um, but now I think the movement is clearly towards more European integration and for good or for worse, this also means that, that the euro will probably be getting bigger, not smaller. 
um, I think it was decided recently that Croatia will join January next, next year, January the 1st. Um, so this will continue instead of falling apart. That doesn't mean, of course, that, that it will work in the sense of delivering full employment and price stability. Okay, the reform of the fiscal framework that was agreed upon for this year is also shifted to next year. So uh, there's talk on all levels, including the president of the Eurogroup, Paolo Gentiloni, who said we need new fiscal, a new fiscal framework, the old rules don't work anymore. So that's the uh, introduction to, to the literature of, of, on the Euro. And that's my presentation, so thank you very much. And I hope that you have lots of questions for me. Jeremy? Yeah, Dirk? Yes. Okay, if you'll pardon me, we've got a sort of unusual situation with the um, audio visual setup here. So we can take questions, but what we'll need to do is uh, Dirk cannot speak while we're asking him questions. And then uh, he's not going to be able to hear us while we're listening to his reply. It's a little unusual, but please bear with me. Um, yeah, my question is, you said that countries in the Eurozone don't have accounts at the ECB. Um, I'm curious, like, who does have accounts at the ECB? And, uh, yeah, and how, do, how, do, how is that integrated with countries' central banks? Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I, I have to say I don't know who has accounts with the ECB. It's not possible to find this information online and um, maybe I should just write them directly. I don't, uh, I don't think that there will be many accounts. So in the Eurozone, you must think of the ECB as the institution that, that sets the interest rates. Um, but all the actual monetary policy is done by the national central banks. So whether it's a bond purchase programs or whether it's uh, repos to stabilize the interbank market interest rate, all of this done is by the national central banks. The, the ECB hardly does anything. Um, so it's, it, its own balance sheet in a way is very small because of the way that the system has been, been set up. Um, so maybe I can just merge this question with the, the other question which I see in, in the chat. Bundesbank cannot supply reserves, so is this advances from ECB? No, it's not. Okay, so all these central banks, these national, national central banks, they can all create euros. Okay, they're all currency issuers. And, and if according to the Eurozone rules, for example, a German bank goes to Deutsche Bundesbank and says, I want to borrow a million euros, then um, if the collateral is good, the, the Bundesbank cannot say no anyway. So just, they just create a million euros. And if the German bank wants to transfer those million euros to, to Spain, because they pay in a Spanish bank, for example, then this money is transferred to the Spanish bank and not via the ECB's balance sheet. Okay, so that's, um, that's how the system is set up. I know that it's a bit strange, but the ECB, again, it's more or less like the head of the operation, but it's not the hands. I hope that this uh, answers the question. Maybe a correlate, like when, am I awful? Yeah, when the central bank, when the ECB intervenes to do things like buy bonds, like what is it, who, whose reserves are it, is it using to do that? What's the operation by which it does that? Uh, again, it, it doesn't do that. Okay, so um, it, it, if it decides, for example, to set up PEP, this pandemic emergency purchase program, it also determines the central banks, the national central banks, that will be told to to uh, to do it. Okay, so it, I think with PEP, it was it was Banco de España, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the Spanish central bank, and I'm not sure whether it was Bundesbank or Banco d'Italia, um, but they don't, they don't, they don't do the, the technical operations on that level. So, so the ECB decides, they take all the big decisions, and then the national central banks, they execute. That's more or less how, how this is done. It sounds like it's not really a bank at all. Or, yeah. Great, thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you for the intervention. Uh, a small question. Do you think that in terms of uh, balance of powers between countries and uh, European institutions, uh, we will be able to overcome the prohibition of uh, the direct monetary uh, funding of uh, states by the ECB? I'm uh, particularly uh, thinking about the, the second paragraph of the 121 article of the Roma Treaty that uh, authorize the funding by the ECB of the public development banks. So do you think also that uh, we could imagine um, like a direct uh, monetary financing circuit of the states by the ECB, uh, public development banks? Um, okay, I, I think that the way that things have worked about 10 years ago, um, there was already the possibility, for example, for the German Bank of Reconstruction and Development to use its own bonds as collateral to secure money from, from the Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, so if you can do that, why do, would you want monetary financing direct? Um, I mean, you can just create a 1 million euro bond if you are the French Bank for Reconstruction of Development and you can use it as collateral to borrow a million from the Banque de France. I mean, of course, it, it, it would be easier to see or maybe administratively a little bit easier to, to have direct financing. Um, but I don't think that you need it. It's not going to make much difference. Um, and especially since we have very low interest rates. Okay, so, so in the Eurozone right now, the national governments cannot run out of money. Okay, so that's the important thing, whether you have direct financing or indirect financing. I mean, if you want to design the most beautiful payment system for the Eurozone ima imaginable, um, then of course you can do it and say it would be nice if the governments could just directly spend. Um, but then of course you would have to, to tell the, the central banks that, um, that they will have to do it for them. And, and that's something where they will say, you're taking away our independence. That's a political fight that I think is not worth it. Okay, so, so you can have national governments and also yeah, national um, banks for reconstruction and development, you can have them, you can give them lots of access to an almost unlimited access uh, to, to financing um, without changing the institutions, without changing the rules. So I think it's because this is a political question, I think that, that politically we will see, see it developing like this. They will, they will tweak some of the rules, they will ignore some of the rules, but I don't think they will rewrite, rewrite the rules and the European constitution or European legal text. I don't think that this will happen. I hope that answers the question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is with regards to um, sovereign spreads that currently are observed in the euro area and have been for some time. Do you think that in the event of this fiscal integration, if it eventually happens, those sovereign spreads will disappear and we will have only one single euro sovereign um, rate? Yeah, well, I mean, we still have this idea that, that the spreads are a feature, not a bug. Um, but we also have the ECB, which, guarantee, which basically has said, we guarantee liquidity and solvency of all the Eurozone governments. I mean, they have, they have said between the lines and, and very, in very bold type, uh, we will not let, let this happen again, uh, referring to what happened to Greece, which, which ran out of money. Um, so I'm, I'm very positive that whatever the ECB is doing, they, they know that, that if we repeat the Eurozone crisis in, from the 2010s, it will blow up the whole eurozone. Okay, so it's definitely not going to happen. The ECB has no mandate to to have um, interest rates in Greece and other uh, countries diverging from from those in Germany and France, for example. Um, because if you have one money, you have to have one interest rate, and that's what the ECB is for. So the ECB is, is supposed to to ensure that you have the same interest rate everywhere, and that means including long term interest rates. So the ECB, I think, within its own mandate, can, can easily say, well, we need to buy up all those government bonds and, and bring spreads back into line um, because, because that's what we have to do as a central bank. I mean, it has to be the same interest rate everywhere. Um, otherwise, we, we, don't have an, we don't even have an instrument, uh, whatever the mandate is. Um, I hope that this, this helps you.
what kind of perspectives were being offered in the Maastricht to the introduction of the Euro period? Uh, what kind of economic perspectives were being offered during that period that were um, concerned about setting up the fiscal straitjacket? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the countries all have probably agreed in those in those happy neoliberal times that that constraining the straight the, the state is a good idea. So. Um, when the euro started in 2002, the first countries to, to break the deficit rules were France and Germany. So they broke the deficit limits year by year. <clears throat> and um, excuse me. <coughs> and they always got a, a blue letter from Brussels saying, stop that. And then the countries of the periphery, like, I don't know, Spain and Ireland or, or Italy and Greece, they said, um, well, you're always breaking the rules, Germany and France. Um, can we make the rules harder? Okay, so that those countries that have too high deficits, that those are punished. Yeah, okay, so that, that was done. And I think it was, it was done in it was 2007, I think, or 2008 even. So just before the crisis really hit, um, they, they went from punishing countries with blue letters uh, to punishing countries with the Troika. And because those countries was, uh, who were then hit with the Troika austerity policies were those who had uh, created the rules in the first place, um, they, they, they didn't say much against this. Um, it, it also beats me, I mean, how could you agree with these kind of strange fiscal uh, rules in the first place? Um, but you, you have to remember um, that there was, I think there was only one economist on the whole planet uh, who wrote about the euro in charterless terms in the mainstream at least, um, which is, um, I think it's um, Charles Goodhart. Um, who wrote, wrote about the charterless perspective on the euro, but apart from MMT and, and this this one mainstream guy, nobody nobody knew how it worked, and and people just didn't know about this. And the policymakers depended on on economists, and the economists said, "Oh no, it's all going to be fine. The only thing that that is going to be missing is the exchange rate problem. So it's going to be easier when you are driving around Europe because you can always use the same currency." That's the level of debate. Um, so. Yeah, it, it was the 1990s, and, and judging it from now, of course, it's, it's impossible almost. So they thought that, that capitalism had, has, had won and communism had lost, and now you would have to give more power to the markets, and that financial markets decide over government spending that was completely acceptable as an ideology, also on the left. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture. Uh, at some point, you mentioned that the the uh, the dominant economic paradigm in the eurozone is uh, losing its uh, legitimacy, and this implies that a, a new economic policy paradigm is is born or is uh, slowly substituting the the previous one. Could you describe describe this new um, economic paradigm in the eurozone? And uh, to your opinion, is it somehow related or resembles or accepts the assumptions and propositions of uh, MMT? Yeah, well, I mean, you kind of answered the question yourself. Um, so I have my own book about money creation in the Eurozone. Um, the German version came out in 2014. And right from the first edition, I said the ECB has to expand its role and it has to always be, stand ready to buy up government bonds to ensure liquidity and solvency of those eurozone governments because otherwise this kind of, of game that investors start to bet against those countries and then bond prices go down, interest rates are go up and this is kind of self-perpetuating. This will never stop otherwise. Um, and um, if you have seen what they've done in 2020 with the pandemic emergency purchase program and also with the, with the cancellation of the deficit limits, I mean my MMT colleagues like uh, Stephanie Kelton, also and Wendell Ray, they have been writing for, for more or less two, two decades that those deficit limits make no sense. Um, so, so what they did was what we have been writing about before. Um, and I think again that it's, um, it's, starting, it's starting to change because the policymakers, they understand that, that what the mainstream delivers is, is just not working. Um, so if we just continue to teach MMT and to tell people about how the monetary system works, 
um, I think then this will be the new, the new kind of theoretical lens through, through which we will look at those kind of, of issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, so obviously MMT is first descriptive, but then there it is often linked to maybe in desire for more industrial um, policy style intervention in the economy. Um, and there you have the European um, Union legal system, which was created by the European Court of Justice itself, which is highly neoliberal and has a lot of um, competition rules. So I was wondering, what is your assessment of the um, current legal setup in um, the European Union with regard to industrial policy? And um, is there space for change here? Well, um, so I'm not a legal expert. I have to say this before, before I continue to speak. Um, but um, I think there's a division of labor between economists and legal scholars um, and also lawyers in all kinds of courts, constitutional courts, um, also in, in European nation states as in the Eurozone. So um, the, the, the lawyers normally, the constitution lawyers normally, they don't want to if interfere too much with the economic. Okay, so, so if, if for some economic policy reason we need this or that, they normally are not willing to, to use some kind of, of legal uh, term to say this is not possible. So, for example, in Germany we have these people who said that it's not okay for the ECB to do QE, to buy up government bonds from, from Greece, for example. And, of course, if you look at the legal text, then it's a little bit doubtful. It doesn't say too much about these kind of things. Um, but the courts have always decided in favor of letting the politicians do what they want to do so far. Okay, so I don't think, for example, that some constitutional court, either the European one or a national one, will say, um, for example, the rules of the Eurozone are not compatible with our constitution and therefore the Euro will have to go. Okay, so it's a political question whether we have the Euro. Uh, I don't think it will be a legal question. So if it's the same with industrial policy. So if the European Commission decides to have industrial policy, and they did that, okay, so we will have microchips factories uh, in the European Union. They decided to spend, I think, dozens of, of billions of euros. Um, it's amazing how, how fast this now goes. Um, so the European Commission already has engaged in industrial policy before, but it's ramping up its effort. Um, I think that the, the zeitgeist in German, so the, the, th <coughs> the thinking of our times, it's changing. And people understand that the free markets, free markets will not solve our problems. Okay, so, so it's not going to happen. And, and outside of the economists' camp, everybody knows that. Okay, so, so I think that's, that's why we have now a very much like a, a shift of opinion and a shift of policy making. And of course, the, the law, sometimes they don't work too well because they were built in another era. Um, so yes, the Eurozone is from the neoliberal past and what you can always do is to ignore the rules. So yes, we have deficit limits, but we enforce only 10% of the time those deficit limits in 2019. Okay, that's as good as abandoning those rules altogether almost. Um, so I don't think that there will be kind, I mean, yes, there will be some kind of legal problems, yes, but there's, I don't think there, will, there is something coming up which will stop us to to develop the Eurozone into something, uh, something uh, with, with, which has more, more public investment because we, we need it, especially because of climate change. So um, last year I was invited to the Irish Parliament. They have a committee on finance and, and they, they, the one question they wanted me to answer is, and the, the existing rules, how can we in Ireland increase government spending on climate related issues? Because it's, the way that things are, are working right now, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and everybody's aware of that. So I think there will be lots of goodwill um, to change the rules and, and to create new ones and, and so on. I hope that answers the question. Answer my question. Okay. Uh, Anybody else? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, hi, and thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you if you are basically saying that the Eurozone will be able to survive despite its flaws in its original setup if the ECB steps up its role? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a political question. It's a, it's a fight for the future of Europe and it was postponed. <laughs> okay, so, so it was created more or less to, to have a United States of Europe and then to add at some point the Euro Treasury. 
which is also what the five presidents report said um, some years ago. But of course, not everybody wants to have the United States of Europe. Some people want to have more sovereignty at the national level. Um, so all of this is a big political fight in the end. Um, so the economic is, is following the political stuff. And what, uh, what we could see in 2020 <coughs> when the pandemic hit was that there was, no, there was no way that because of the pandemic they could somehow say, we now create a Euro treasury and we spend billions and billions more at Brussels uh, to take care of the health situation. Uh, it was clear that this had to be addressed by the national governments. So they gave monetary sovereignty back to those governments. Um, and that's politics. You, you are trying to, to stop everything from falling apart. Um, and, and, and that's how it works. So, so the euro is, is now not as dysfunctional as it was uh, until 2019. It's much better now. Um, but of course, it could always revert back to, to 2019 with the Stability and Growth Pact in place. But as I said, they didn't enforce the Stability and Growth Pact fully anyway. Um, so I, I think with the discussions of the fiscal framework now being in place, I think that, yeah, I think that there's, there's going to be a new, some kind of political compromise. Uh, and we can, we can hope that this will be a better one, but I'm sure that they will stabilize this compromise because we see a Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Eurozone cannot they cannot afford politically to create now a new Eurozone crisis. It would be mad if this would happen. Um, and, and I think that, that everybody knows that this is, would be completely mad. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of, so, yeah, I, I kind of expect um, that the Euro will somehow, um, yeah, move into the future and they will try to, to change the, the fiscal rules um, to, to maybe insert some be, something like full employment targets maybe or, or maybe not in that language. But I think that, that this has been recognized by, by all the European policymakers um, that the EU needs to be fixed and that it's, it's not good to go into the next, or into this century, we, we need to change those rules. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Can you answer my question? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor, for the lecture. Um, my question is, um, if Europe finally decides to um, move away from uh, the pact and the austerity measures, um, firstly, can you, uh, can you see which outcome would be more likely between uh, having a common uh, fiscal budget and programs like Next Generation EU or allowing governments to have more fiscal space and run fiscal deficits? And um, do you think one is more favorable outcome between these two? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so, so I think that theoretically both systems could work. Okay, so you could create the United States of Europe, which has a Euro Treasury, a big European, not commission, but European government. And then we would have maybe a second chamber, not the Eurozone parliament, but something equivalent. Um, that would be one possibility to have the, the European government uh, being responsible for, our, for the unemployment rate. Okay, so if there's too much unemployment, voters can vote for, for a party that says we will increase government spending. Um, the other solution is to more or less go back to national monetary sovereignty. Um, and, and that's what we have been doing right now. I think that's also more or less politically sustainable. Um, so I think that would also work. Um, I think that, well, I, I haven't made up my mind yet, which I would prefer, to be honest. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to understand all this. And I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, always, it's always very nasty when a new nation is born and so on. And, and if you look at the US history, for example, it also took a while until the dollar worked. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it's inherently difficult, but I would say, so as a, as a prediction, let's put it like this. So I think that those who are in favor of United States of Europe, they will push for the next generation EU program to be scaled up and then renewed and then maybe financed by a Euro treasury. Um, that's the one side pushing for this direction and the other side will try to abolish the stability and growth pact, try to make the ECB into the lender of, or dealer of last resort. Um, that's going to be the other side. So, um, and it's not clear to all those who are inter arguing in terms of economics uh, what the result is in terms of politics. Um, so I think it should be up to the people of Europe to decide whether they want to have the United States of Europe or not and what that looks like. Um, but um, 
I'm um, I'm not a I'm not a political scientist, so I, I've read the book by Piketty, this proposal about the Eurozone government from like four or five years ago. Um, yeah, that would be a way to go forward, but um, maybe the climate crisis would be also something with, something with, which can unite us and, um, and lead to some kind of, of idea of, of being European in a sustainable way. But again, um, that's just, just me making things up. Dirk. Thank you very, very much, especially for your optimistic scenario. Thanks, Dimitri, for having me. Thank you, everybody.